Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast... Please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis by mailing a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just check us out at patreon.greatdetectives.net. But now it is time for this week's episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers, the original air date, July 20th, 1952, and the title is Round Trip. <laughs> of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tomorrow, NBC's 300-man news staff will once again spring into action to bring you every important news development of the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Yes, from wherever news is being made, NBC will present it when it happens. Following their comprehensive broadcasts from the Republican National Convention one week ago, NBC received thousands of letters praising their most complete coverage. One teacher from Michigan wrote, quote, Again, may I express my gratitude to your network for being on the scene of every important development during the Republican National Convention. I have recorded all of the important speeches, commentary, and balloting on my Webster Electric Echo Tape Recorder, and I intend to record all of the Democratic Convention from NBC, too, unquote. Well, our teacher friend need not worry, for NBC will have expert radio reporters such as George Hicks, Morgan Beatty, and Richard Harkness, making it possible for you to attend the Democratic Convention on NBC. Make NBC and this station your convention headquarters. Now, Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Round Trip. It is a Thursday evening in May, 1946, in the city of Houston, Texas. In a shabby travel agency near the waterfront, several people are sitting on benches ranged around the walls of the poorly lighted room. A little past eight o'clock, a man enters, speaks a few words to the clerk, then walks toward one of the men at the other end of the room. Your name Dave Hobart? Yeah, that's right. You the fellow that's driving up to Waco? That's right. You got your baggage with you? Yeah, just this one suitcase. Where's your car? On front. Okay. You know, I was beginning to think maybe you weren't coming. No, oh, I got delayed. Truth of the matter is, I promised to bring my kid a toy fire engine for his birthday. <laughs> Forgot all about it till most of the stores were closed. I had an awful time finding that fire engine. But I got it. Hope you didn't mind waiting too much. Yeah, not as long as you got here. I don't feel like spending another night in Houston, I tell you. This your car? Yeah. I'll get in this side and slide over. Just throw your suitcase on top of those newspapers in the back seat. All right. Hey, what you doing with all those papers? Oh, I'm a bundle carrier for two papers. Run the regular route between here and Waco. I just take passengers along and pick up a few extra bucks. Oh? Bundle carrying pay pretty good money? Well, it's a living. Uh-huh. Hey, where you going? This isn't the way to the Waco road. Yeah, I know. Got another passenger to pick up down at the end of the block. <laughs> If he hasn't got tired of waiting and left. <laughs> been working down here in Houston? I've been looking for a job. 
Just got back from Germany a few months ago. Army? Yeah. No good jobs around now. Guys who got back first took them off. I reckon that's the other passenger over there. Hey! Hey, you the fella that's going up towards Waco? Yeah. Hey, you sure took your time getting here. <sighs> Where am I to put these two suitcases? Oh, you know, just throw them on top of those newspapers and back. Uh, 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 I'd known it was going to be so crowded in your car, I'd have waited and taken the train in the morning. Eh, don't worry. We'll get you where you're going. Hope both of you fellas like coffee. I usually stop a couple times on the way. That's okay. Sure. As long as you don't make too many stops. <laughs> Been driving this night route ten years now. Only thing I don't like about it, don't give me enough time with my wife and kid. Either you fellas married? Uh. Uh-uh. How about you? Nah, I'm in the Merchant Marine. Seen lots of girls in lots of countries. None of them worth marrying. <laughs> <laughs> You'd change your mind one of these days. <laughs> Nothing like it. Having a wife and kid to come home to. You know something? I take passengers on this run almost every night, make an extra five or six bucks. And every cent of that money goes into a special account, earmarked for sending my boy to college. Is that so? Yep. My wife and me, we made up our minds he's not going to carry newspapers for a living. We're giving him the best education we can get for him. Yeah, well, sometimes even when you've been to school, you got trouble making a living. Not my kid. He's really going to be something. Yeah, hold the wheel a second, will you? Okay. I want to show you a picture of him. I got in my wallet. <laughs> Let's get this rubber band off. Here. Oh, all right, I got the wheel now. <laughs> See if you don't think he's the finest kid you ever set eyes on. Oh, bring it over closer to the dashboard line. Well, what do you think of him? Good looking boy. Yeah. Hey, you are, mister. Thanks. You mind holding the wheel again? Every time my wallet gets full, I have trouble getting this picture back in. You shouldn't carry so much money in it. Oh, got to. It's collection day. Ah. There we are. Oh, I'll take the wheel now. You mean to say you collected all that money just from newspapers? Oh, you'd be surprised how it mounts up. <laughs> I wish it was all mine. <laughs> That's an awful lot of dough. Yeah. It sure is. At 8.20 the next morning, a highway employee cutting grass alongside the road 10 miles south of Colby, Texas, found the body of a man lying in the ditch. There were two bullet wounds in his head. When the sheriff arrived, he immediately recognized the man as Robert Dixon of Waco. The sheriff requested assistance from the Texas Rangers. And at 9.25, Ranger Jace Pearson pulled up in his car. 10-4. KDX Howdy, Sheriff. Howdy, Jace. Howdy's right down here. I understand you knew this fellow. Yeah, I knew him. Bob Dixon was the finer man you'd want to meet. There's the body, Jace. How did you happen to know him? He had a newspaper bundle out between Houston and Waco. I used to see him in diners along the road. He was a great coffee drinker, just like me. We got to be pretty good friends, meeting like that every week or so. Uh huh. You located the car he was driving? Well, I thought it was found about 15 minutes ago, but it turned out to be a false alarm. Uh, I checked his pockets, Jace. Empty? Cleaned out. Pretty clear case of robbery. The bullets entered his head from the right side. These powder burns means he was shot at close range. Yeah, well, I figured it was somebody who was riding with him. Was he in the habit of picking up people? Yeah, he had some kind of arrangement with the travel agencies down in Houston. He used to carry a passenger or two with him almost every night. Yeah, we better check with those agencies, see if they can tell us who rode with Dixon last night. Well, as far as I know about those places, sometimes they keep a record of customers' names and sometimes they don't. Uh huh. Well, right now, it's the only lead we've got. Sounds like my call. Better see what they want. You know, Dixon was always talking about his wife and kid. Never seen a man so proud of his family. I'd sure like to get my hands on the one who did this. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead, KTXA. Car registered to Robert Dixon of Waco has been located by Highway Patrol near Farm Road 42, three miles south of Colby. 10 4, Unit 10 clear. KDXA Austin. That ought to give us something to go on. Yeah, let's get over there. The highway patrol was waiting for us on Farm Road 42. Dixon's car was about 50 yards from the road, half covered with brush. The sheriff and I walked toward it. 
Well, it looks like he started to hide the car and then changed his mind. Uh-huh. Help me pull this brush aside, will you, Sheriff? Well, I can't help wondering why he picked this spot to leave it. Seems to me he'd have dished it closer to town, or else picked a place where it wouldn't have been found so quick. Well, there's one reason he might have left it here. There's blood on the front seat. You mean because there's so much of it? Yeah. He probably got panicky when he got close to town, decided to walk the rest of the way. Well, that sounds logical, Jace. But it still don't bring us much closer to knowing who did it. We we'll bring a lab crew to go over the car for prints. Maybe... Wait a minute. What's the matter? A slip of paper above the sun visor here. Yeah. Anything interesting? Could be. Pick up Dave Hobart at Thomas Travel Agency. Thursday, 8 p.m. Jeez, that is something. Yeah. Here is tracks going toward the road. More than likely, he just hightailed for town as soon as he ditched the car. That's funny. Hmm? Tracks turn into that brush. Now, why would he go off this way? That don't make... Jeez, next to that rock. Yeah. Leather jacket and a pair of khaki trousers. No doubt about their being his. Look at the bloodstains on him. Uh, must have shed these right after he left the car. That means he probably had other clothes with him. Yeah, well, I'll go through the pockets here. I doubt if he left anything in them, but uh, you never can tell. Well, there's nothing in the trousers. Try the jacket. Well, there's a couple of pennies. Looks like they've been in the pocket for quite a while. And they... Hey, here's the stuff of a bus ticket. Uh, Colby to Houston. Any date on the back? Well, it's kind of blurred. Uh, see if I can make it out here. Yeah, May 14th of 46. Well, that was Tuesday. Sounds like the man we're looking for could live right here in Colby. Well, this Dave Hobart, the fellow whose name was on that slip of paper in the car, you reckon he's the one that killed Dixon? We won't know that till we find him. We decided that the best way to locate Dave Hobart was to check all post offices in the area. We didn't have to look far. The postmaster at Colby told us an ex-soldier by that name lived on a farm with his parents 12 miles south of town. The farmhouse was about a mile off the main highway, not far from the spot where Dixon's body had been found. When we arrived at the house, we saw someone chopping wood next to a shed. I reckon he's the fellow we're looking for. Uh, Could be. Your name, Dave Hobart? What? Yeah. Something I do, boy? First thing you can do is drop that axe. What's all this about? Drop it. Okay. Were you in Houston last night? Why? We'll ask the questions. Were you in Houston? Uh, yeah. When did you go down there? Well, Tuesday morning. When did you come back? Last night? Huh? How? Paid a man to give me a ride. Through the Thomas Travel Agency? How'd you know? I told you we'd ask the questions. This man you rode with, did he have newspapers in the back of his car? Well, what if he did? He was robbed and killed last night by somebody riding with him. It was okay when I got out of the car. Besides, there was another guy with him. Who was he? How should I know? You gotta do better than that, Hobart. You have a gun? Only gun I ever had was the one Uncle Sam gave me. I was sure glad to give it back to him. Why were you in Houston? Because I was looking for a job. Did you find one? I had a few offered to me, but I didn't take them. Why not? Because they didn't pay enough. Robbing and killing pays more, huh? Now, you look, Sheriff. I didn't kill this guy. You find that other fella in the car and you got your killer. Hobart, you say you were in the Army. Yeah. And I reckon you got some more khaki trousers like the ones you got on. And I reckon you're wrong. This is the only pair I got left. You ever own a leather jacket? No. We'll check and find out if you're telling the truth. Well, go on, check. How'd you get into Houston on Tuesday? Go to ride. You sure you didn't take the bus from Colby? Why would I go back there to take it? This is 12 miles closer to Houston. You might have been in town that morning. Then you'd have got on there. I wasn't in town. And what's taking a bus got to do with this anyhow? We found a canceled bus ticket from Colby to Houston that we're pretty sure the killer used. It's dated Tuesday, the day you went to Houston. Look, you got the wrong man, I'm telling you. Maybe so, but you're coming along with us anyhow. Where to? To the bus station in Colby. Maybe somebody there will remember if they sold you a ticket. We arrived in Colby a little past noon. The bus station was located in a restaurant across from the courthouse. Through the window, we could see a heavy-set woman sitting at the cash register eating a large piece of pie. The sheriff said she ran both the restaurant and the bus station. He took Hobart inside. Go on in, Hobart. All right. Howdy. Something I can do for you. Howdy, Maggie. Ranger and I'd like to ask you some questions, if you don't mind. Oh, I don't mind. 
Hey, Sheriff, you ever eat any of my hot raspberry pie? I don't believe so. Oh, it's mighty good if I do say so. Let me cut you boys a slice. Uh, not right now, thanks. Only thing I've got against raspberries are seeds keep getting in my teeth. What you fellas want to know? You the only one who sells the bus tickets here? Yeah. And never somebody takes a notion to buy one. Did you ever see this boy before? Who, listen? He's kind of shy, ain't he? Here, lift up your head, sonny. Let me get a look at you. He's a good-looking boy. Yeah, I reckon I've seen him a few times. Did you sell him a bus ticket to Houston on Tuesday? Well, this past Tuesday? Uh-huh. Well, uh, that was a mighty slow day. I only sold three or four tickets. Just one of them was to Houston. Did this boy here buy it? Oh, uh, no. I don't reckon he did. You see? I told you, right. Just a minute, Hobart. You remember who did buy it, ma'am? Well, let me see. Just got to organize myself here a minute. Oof. Always feel a little sluggish right after I eat. Oh, yeah. Now I remember it was uh, Jim Mayo bought the ticket. Jim Mayo? Jace, if he's mixed up in this at all, he's our man. What makes you so sure? Well, I've known him ever since he was a kid. Got caught forging checks when he was 15. Been up for everything from vacancy to horse theft. Mm, we still got to be sure the ticket we found was the one that was sold to Mayo. Ma'am, you keep a record of the serial numbers on the tickets you sell? Yeah, I've got them in my audit book on that shelf behind me. Mind looking up the number of that ticket you sold Tuesday? Oh, uh, all right, Ranger. Uh, I didn't even know Mayo was back in town. Thought he was in the Merchant Marine. Mm, could have been between ships. Oh, the fellow in the car with me said he was in the Merchant Marine. Here, here we are. Oh. Let me see now. You got the ticket, Sheriff? Right in this envelope. Tuesday, May 14th, yeah. Colby to Houston. Ticket number 3544. What's our ticket say, Sheriff? Says Mayo's the one we're after. Look, Jace, 3544. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. There are seven million smart people in this country. Are you one of them? Yes, every payday, seven million people save a total of $140 million. Mister, that's a lot of money in anybody's book. Who are these people that save all that dough? Millionaires? Big executives? Nope, they're just average people. But they're smart. They know the only sure way to save is to do it systematically, every payday. And they know there's no safer, better way to do so than by buying United States defense bonds through the payroll savings plan where they work or the bond-a-month plan where they bank. How those savings steadily mount up, too. Because they go into improved Series E defense bonds that now pay 3% interest, compounded semi-annually, when held to maturity. Why don't you join the millions of smart people building their future now with regular investments in defense bonds? They're now even better. Now, the second act of Tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Round Trip. We released Dave Hobart, then went to the house in Colby where Jim Mayo's parents lived. They said he'd gone to Houston Tuesday and had not been home since. We put out an APB on him and stationed a deputy at his house. Then we started checking Seaman's hiring halls in the port cities, hoping to pick up a lead on his whereabouts. We worked along the coast from Galveston, and on Saturday morning, we walked up the stairs of the hiring hall at Corpus Christi. I'm getting discouraged, Jace. Could be he didn't even come near one of these hiring halls. Used to me, shipping out would be the first thing he'd try to do. Well, I sure hope this dispatcher can tell us something. Boys, anybody interested in throwing your cards at the window? What's on your minds, gents? You're not figuring to ship out, are you? We'd like some information from you. Well, if it's about ships, you've got the right man. You remember seeing a man named Jim Mayo in here? Mm, I reckon so. When was he in here last? Yesterday. Jeez. Uh-huh. You happen to know where we can find him? Mm, I reckon I do. Mind telling us? I think I sent him on to the John Duncan yesterday. She's bound through the canal for Honolulu. You make sure of that? Yeah, look it up in my card file here. Uh, he's a fireman water tender, you know. Got a lot of calls lately for fireman water tenders. Uh-huh. Oh, here, here's his card. Wait a minute. What's the matter? I'll give you gents some wrong information. 
Mayo's not on the John Duncan. Well, that's a relief. Glad we don't have to go all the way to Honolulu for him. No, Mayo signed on to the Humphrey Victory. She left last night. Where was she bound? Let me see. Yeah, Victoria, Brazil. I called headquarters and informed them that Mayo was on a ship headed for Brazil. It was decided that he should be arrested when his ship arrived in Victoria. Clearance was made with the Brazilian government through the American embassy in Rio. The sheriff and I were detailed to make the arrest and bring the prisoner back. We boarded a plane and flew to Victoria. On the morning of the 2nd of June, not quite three weeks after Robert Dixon was killed, the ship on which Mayo was working dropped anchor for quarantine just outside the Victoria Harbor. Together with Lieutenant Delato of the Brazilian police, the sheriff and I rode out toward the ship in a harbor patrol launch. Won't be long, Jace. I can make out the faces of the people standing along the rail now. Yeah. The looks of the braid on his hat, I'd say the fellow standing by the gangway is Captain Dreyer. You are sure, senor, that all has been prepared for you aboard the ship? We've been in radio contact with the captain. And this uh, Mayo, you are sure he does not uh, have word that you have come? Not unless the radio operator is a special friend of his. I won't do him much good if he does know. He's boxed up on there like a maverick at Brandon time. I beg your pardon, senor. Now, the sheriff means it'd be hard for Mayo to get off the ship. Oh, well, here we are. Now, let's get aboard. Well, the way this thing's bombing around, I hope I don't break my neck getting onto those steps. You making it all right, Sheriff? Yeah. And I'd just soon have come after this guy on a horse. Ranger Pearson? That's right, Captain. It's Lieutenant Delato and Sheriff Holton. I, I do. do. I've got to admit this is a new experience, having a ranger and sheriff board my ship in a foreign port. It's not exactly run-of-the-mill for us, either. No, I suppose not. Well, I followed your instructions, Ranger. Mayo doesn't have any idea you're after him. Where is he now? On watch in the engine room. Well, maybe it'd be a good idea to clear the other men out of there before we go down after him. They could get hurt if he makes trouble. Oh, don't worry about that, Sheriff. Chief Engineer tells me Mayo's on donkey watch. That means he's down there alone. Would you take us to the engine room entrance? Sure, this way. How do you get him back to the States? Now, we've already booked passage on the Goodman Victory. She's sailing for New Orleans at midnight. Goodman? Life's well, just like this one. She hasn't got a brig. We got one of the cabins set up for mail. Oh, here we are. You want me to go down with you? If you don't mind, we'd rather have you and the lieutenant stay here. We'll pick him up alone. Okay. Good luck. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Feel that heat, Jace. Really slaps you in the face. I don't know how a man can work down here. Yeah, I reckon you get used to anything. Yeah. There he is. Between those boilers. Got his back to us. He's working on something at that table. He sees us now. Get ready in case he tries to duck behind one of those boilers. Yeah. Well, if it isn't my old friend the sheriff. Got a ranger with you, too, huh? You fellas a little far from home, ain't you? We've come to get you, Mayo. Me? For what? So we can take you back to the States. You're wanted for the murder of Robert Dixon. I don't even know anybody by that name. You rode with him from Houston to Colby on the night of May 16th. We think you robbed and killed him. You don't know what you're talking about. If you're innocent, you'll have a chance to prove it back in Texas. Come on, Mayo. Don't be crazy. I'm not going anywhere with you. This is Brazil. What's that got to do with it? I know my rights. You got no authority to arrest me here. It's all been taken care of. There's a Brazilian police officer up above with the captain. Now let's get going. Oh, yeah? Okay, if that's the way you want it. Look out, Jason's got a wrench. Yeah. You think you're going to get me? Drop that wrench. I'll get both of you. Drop it. That's better. Now get moving. we got a long trip ahead of us. We put Mayo aboard the ship that was to take us back to the States and locked him in a cabin. Lieutenant Delato stayed in the passageway outside the cabin to guard him while the sheriff and I went to the dock office to place an overseas call to Austin. I informed headquarters that we had arrested Mayo and were sailing with him that night. It was nearly five in the afternoon when we walked across the dock back to the ship's gangway. Stevedores were loading the last of the cargo aboard. Too bad you couldn't get a real good connection when you talked to Austin, Jason. I think they understood what I had to say. Uh huh. Well, <laughs> look at those sacks of coffee going aboard. <laughs> Hundreds of them. Makes no coffee drinker like you happy just to look at him, huh? Well, at least I know we won't run out of it on the trip home. <laughs> Chief Mate said we should be in New Orleans in ten days. Uh, I'll be glad to see Texas again. Too far away to suit me. It's been a long haul. It's not over yet. Uh, see, the lieutenant's fixed himself up real comfortable. Chair, newspaper, and all. 
You have made the call, Ranger Pearson? Yeah, we got through. How's the prisoner? All is quiet, senor. Not a sound from him. I think maybe he sleeps. Yeah, it must be pretty warm in there with that porthole closed. Reckon we ought to take him out for a while, Jace? Yeah, it's about time for him to have some food anyhow. You have the key, Lieutenant? See, si, uh, here you are, senor. I'll get him, Jace. I will be sorry to see you go, senor. It has been a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Jace! What's wrong? The porthole's been jimmied open. Mail's gone. <laughs> Lieutenant Delato immediately notified his headquarters of the prisoner's escape. The Brazilian police threw a cordon around the city. The sheriff and I started checking along the waterfront. Not a trace of Mayo. By seven that evening, we'd worked well into the center of town and were walking down a street toward the first of five or six dimly lighted cafes. I'm beginning to think we're not going to find him in any of these places. Well, he might have slipped through the police net and gotten into the jungle. If he has, it's going to be tough finding him again. It won't be easy for Mayo either if he does get into that jungle. Before long, he'll be wishing he never got away. Uh-huh. Let's check this bar, Sheriff. Well, they don't seem to be in here. No. Let's go on and check. Oh, it's you, Captain. Why don't you and the Sheriff sit down and join me? Thank you, but I'm afraid we haven't time. Well, we'll make it again. Shame you two had to make that long trip down here for nothing. For nothing? Well, sure, you released your prisoner, didn't you? He escaped, Captain. Escaped? Well, I just saw him walking around town. I thought, sure, you decided to let him go. When did you see him? Well, couldn't have been more than five minutes ago. Poked his head in here, looked around, and then took off. You remember which way he went? Well, I'm not sure, but I think he went on down the street. Could be in one of those other bars, Jase. Let's find out. Thanks, Captain. Don't mention it. I hope you catch up with him. Next bar is just a couple of doors down. No. Mayo sure got a lot of nerve walking around in the open like this. But that's the way he always was, ever since I... Sheriff. Huh? In this cafe toward the back. How about that? Mayo, sitting at a table big as life. Come on. He must have been figuring on a big evening. Look at those beer bottles on the table in front of him. I think he sees us. Watch yourself moving in. Yeah. Chase, he's picking up a beer bottle. What? Don't come any closer, Ranger. This bottle I just busted. You get near me, I'm going to use it on you. Careful, Jace. Yeah. I said keep away. Keep away! I, I said you weren't going to get me. Come on, Mayo. Now with you. We'll see about that. Get up. You dirty cop. You all right, Jace? Yeah. If I ever had any doubts about you committing that murder, Mayo, I've lost them now. What are you talking about? I'm innocent. Then why'd you try to escape? Why shouldn't I bust out? I told you I was innocent. I got my constitutional right. Yeah? The Constitution says you're entitled to a trial by jury. And that's just what you're going to get. Come on. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. For the Republicans, it's Eisenhower and Nixon. For the Democrats, it's still a race to see who will come out ahead in party favor. This week is all important for the Democratic Party as they hold the National Convention in Chicago. And you'll want to hear every history-making development direct from the convention beginning tomorrow on this station. NBC's Ace News staff and technical crew, more than 300 people, will bring you all of the news as it happens throughout the convention city tomorrow and every day of the convention. So be sure to make this NBC station your convention headquarters. With microphones placed in every strategic location in convention hall, in candidates' headquarters, and in NBC's own special studios high above the convention floor, you can be sure of hearing all of the news. Men like George Hicks, H.V. Kaltenborn, Richard Harkness, and dozens of others will bring you all the important news developments. So attend the Democratic Convention on NBC. Now, the conclusion of Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. Jim Mayo was returned to the United States without further incident. Ballistics experts testified that a revolver identified as Mayo's was the one which killed Robert Dixon. Dave Hobart, the ex-soldier in the news carrier's car, declared that Mayo was the man who had ridden with him and Dixon. Jim Mayo was found guilty of murder with malice and sentenced to 60 years in Huntsville Penitentiary. 
Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Tales of the Texas Rangers is heard weekly overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Hal Gibney speaking. Wednesday is here, the best of Groucho on NBC. Welcome back. Well, this is the first episode in a while that deployed the make us sympathetic to someone and then have them get murdered technique, but you definitely uh, did feel that and were hoping the lowdown killer would be captured. I have to say that in terms of the sheriff accompanying Jace Pearson, this might be the least believable instance of that. It tends to be something that's done to combine characters and to avoid having to have too many actors or too many voices in an episode. But the idea that the sheriff would actually go to Brazil as the guy who is in charge of law enforcement for an entire county seems just a tad unbelievable. Plus, you know, imagine a sheriff doing that today and trying to tell voters that, yeah, I was out of the county for about three weeks. I went to South America, but it was just entirely uh, for business. And of course, you had to appreciate the killer claiming to know his rights, which apparently included escaping and not being arrested in his mind. Uh, but uh, that does show that a lot of people who talk about knowing their rights don't know what they're talking about. I was also a bit intrigued by the NBC commercial for their convention coverage, particularly the Michigan school teacher who wrote in and said that they'd gone ahead and recorded the coverage of the Republican convention. And that would be an interesting record because due to the nature of live coverage, a lot of the pre-television conventions uh, were, you know, we don't really have full archives available. And certainly the old school conventions were a lot more interesting. Today, our political conventions have an air of anticlimax. The primaries pick the party nominees, and then the party nominees shape the way the convention goes and the message that goes out, and it becomes an infomercial for the fall campaign. The old school conventions, you know, where they said that the Democratic nominee uh, was not decided, and that then when they were coming together, party was going to actually have a debate on its direction, uh, who it was, not only who it was going to nominate, but what they were going to be about and what their overall message and focus was. And the results could be somewhat unpredictable. Now, whether interesting is good, it is interesting for historical purposes. And I did a search, and I actually found that first item to come up for audio from the 1952 Republican Convention was holdings at the University of Michigan. And I wondered, did those recordings by that Michigan school teacher, uh, end up at that university. At any rate, we turn to listener comments and feedback. We start with Ray, who in a, a longer a comment over on greatdetectives.net notes, regarding tales of the Texas Rangers, in glancing, I didn't see any mention of the mid-50s TV version, which I used to view in my teen years. 
Well, thank you so much. Appreciate the comment, Raymond. And I should update our Tales of the Texas Rangers page uh, with that information. Uh, you know, obviously we're focused on the radio program, but there was a TV show which I should talk about a little bit. The TV version aired from 1955 to 1959, and it starred Willard Parker as Jace Pearson and Harry Lauder as Clay Morgan. And in many ways, it was a different series than the uh, radio version. For one thing, I think the radio version was more pitched to adults. It began right as Ragnet had taken off and was trying to build on that success in a similar vein. The TV version was more targeted towards kids and you know, maybe a bit families with a strong Western focus. And prior to Gunsmoke, the real successful TV Westerns, whether you're talking about The Lone Ranger or anything else, tended to be pitched towards that younger audience. And the series furthered that Western feel by adapting cases that were modern and also cases that were set uh, during the Old West time. So, one week's episode might be set in the 1950s. The up next week's could be set in the 1850s. But it was the same two characters. And there was also that stronger emphasis on partnership. Which I think we've kind of seen uh, a bit experimentally with uh, Tales of the Texas Rangers. The first season was, for the most part, Jace Pearson on his own, or working with the Sheriff of the Week, but there have been quite a few episodes in this uh, later season where he's been partnered up with uh, Clay Morgan, and that would be a weekly thing. It also had a theme song with actual lyrics. He's the stalwart man of Texas. Jace Pearson is his name. His partner Clay is right beside him. Each day has proved their fame. All Texas Rangers sworn to duty. Their work is never through. They'll fight and fight for right and justice and enforce the law for you. And this song would be played at the beginning of the episode. It would start out with Jace Pearson walking down the street alone, then joined by Clay Morgan, and then by essentially, I think, a company or two worth of Texas Rangers. And that process would reverse where the Rangers uh, disappeared, leaving Jace at, alone at the end, uh, with uh, the second uh, verse being sung. These are the tales of the Texas Rangers, a band of sturdy men. Always on the side of justice, they fight and fight again. All Texas Rangers sworn to duty, courageous, brave, and true, ever marching, ever ready to enforce the law for you. And you can find the theme on YouTube. I'm not going to risk copyright problems by playing the whole thing for you. And the TV series was actually copyrighted and renewed, but growing up, I never, ever saw it anywhere. And it's one of those series that's under copyright, but... There are no official DVD releases, and you can't stream it anywhere. But those who have seen it uh, and remember it uh, do so fondly. It's got an 8.2 average on IMDb, which is higher than Gunsmoke. And I'm not saying it was better than Gunsmoke. Uh, there's a big difference in the number of ratings. 7,000 people have rated Gunsmoke, and only about 110 have rated Tales of the Texas Rangers. At any rate, it was a really interesting uh, continuation of talking about the uh, Texas Rangers and getting younger folks of the time interested in it. Then we have a comment from a listener regarding the episode Travesty over on YouTube, Maybe it was just a sign of the times, but that deputy just acted as if he was above the law. He didn't want to cooperate with the investigation. 
flies off at the handle when questioned, and then asks for his badge back. Well, as I said when I talked about it in the episode, there were a lot of mitigating factors. He was young, financial stress, and dealing with the challenges of having a a new baby at home. But I think it definitely is a feel of of the time. Uh, There's an attitude that you'll often see portrayed in so much media of the era. Uh, that you know somebody, you know them to be an honest and good person, somebody accuses them of doing something bad, they must be a liar or a bad person. You should believe the people you know, the people whose character you know and trust. And it's fair for you to expect that. It's fair for you to expect that if somebody accuses you of something, that the people who work you work with, the people who you know, are going to have your back. And they are going to help you out. The problem with that, particularly when you put it into the context of a police agency, is that sometimes you don't know people as well as you think you do. And not only that, even if allegations are false, people need to believe that the police will investigate and really seriously examine allegations against their own officers. That there will be a process where people who wield the ability to use deadly force are held accountable and don't get away with things. Because if they're getting away with things, the public's not going to trust them. And not only that, there are going to be abuses. And that has been a hard lesson to really learn and implement. And you did begin to see some shifts in media in uh, even the 1960s and 70s. Uh, Dragnet was a good example on that. In one episode, Sergeant Friday shot someone, killed them, and had to appear before a shooting board, which wasn't something that happened when uh, something similar occurred in the 1950s episode. But the focus of the episode was showing the shooting board, showing that he really was in a bit of jeopardy, And even though he had not done anything wrong, he still had to find the evidence. And it can be a difficult thing. Uh, Adam-12, which again had that Jack Webb connection, did an early episode where Officer Malloy had to fatally shoot someone. And the whole episode, you know, you didn't uh, experience the shooting, but you saw him really being put through the ringer uh, as he had his actions examined and scrutinized. And the push of the series was that that's the sort of thing that needs to happen. There needs to be accountability. That doesn't mean that it's easy. Law enforcement officers put in so much dedication and sacrifice so much for their jobs that it can be like a gut punch to find yourself having your integrity questioned and having assumptions made by people who were not parties to the action and in their minds they acted completely appropriately and they may very well have been when it's all said and done. But if you can't deal with that process, then you're not really going to make it in a law enforcement career. Certainly not in the 21st century and probably not in the 1950s or 60s either. Thank you so much for your comment. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I do want to go ahead and thank Joey, Patreon supporter since June of 2019. Currently supporting the program at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Joey. And that will actually do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, I do encourage you to follow us using your favorite podcast software. 
and uh, be sure to rate and review us wherever you download the podcast from. We will be back next Saturday with another episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. Coming up tomorrow, I do encourage you to check out Public Domain Video Theater, and we'll have an episode of U.S. Marshal. And you can check out our video podcast over at videotheater.greatdetectives.net or you can also watch it on our YouTube channel at youtube.greatdetectives.net. And of course, we'll be back on Monday with Sam Spade where... But he didn't give me a chance. Oh dear, I'm so glad you called, Mr. Spade. I really am. I call for a reason, Mr. Swan. I'm resigning this case. Oh dear, Mr. Spade, you can't do that. You really can't. I don't think you've been quite honest with me, Mr. Swan. Oh dear. Tears I... will get you nowhere. I made a routine check on your reasons for hiring me, and they don't quite fit with the reasons you gave. Uh... They really just don't quite, Mr. Swan. It's no game, Mr. Spade. Believe me. He. He's back tonight. Right now, he's standing beneath the lamppost outside my window, and I'm frightened to death. Mm. Uh, please hurry over, Mr. Spade, and let's get this business straightened out. Please, please. And stupid, stupid me, I went over. And I found that little white cottage on the hill looking grim and gaunt in the heavy fog. Amy's words about it being crushed with barrenness, full of brooding and death, came back to me. And Mr. Swan's frightened words about a mysterious man in dark clothes waiting beneath the streetlight also came back to me, particularly when I noted there was no streetlight near the house. However, there was a light somewhere in the rear of the house, and the front door was ajar. Oh, Mr. Swan! Mr. Swan, are you here? Oh, Mr. Swan, it's me, Sam Spade. Are you here? Mr. Spade? Is that you? Are you out there? Where are you? Ah! <laughs> Things happened fast. I turned around to find the front door filled with a man in a dark suit. He had something in his hand. It looked like a roll of cotton candy, but it felt different. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.